everyone. Uh, my name is Sasha Stone. I'm the president of SICE Careers in Diplomacy, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you for a conversation with Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad, the former U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation, uh, hosted by the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, uh, Careers in Diplomacy, and Caucasus in Central Asia, Asia Club. Uh, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Ambassador Khalilzad uh, for joining us today to talk about his extensive work in Afghanistan, a thank you to Professor Nasser for moderating and helping to coordinate this event, and a thank you to all of our attendees who are both here in person and tuning in via live stream. This is, of course, a very relevant, timely, and important topic in American foreign policy. The recent Taliban military and political takeover of Afghanistan brought an end to two decades of U.S. efforts to transform the country into a democratic, pro-Western policy, polity, and triggered a humanitarian crisis. What happened in Afghanistan and what should be the United States policy toward the region moving forward? To help us answer these questions, we are honored to host Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad, who served as the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation from September 2018 to October 2021 under the administrations of President Trump and President Biden. As the administration's top envoy to Afghanistan, Ambassador Khalilzad negotiated directly with the Taliban, brokered the peace deal in which the U.S. promised to withdraw all U.S. forces, and facilitated the final United States withdrawal from Afghanistan. Ambassador Khalilzad's long and distinguished career in American foreign policy includes serving as U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Ambassador to Iraq, and Ambassador to Afghanistan. Professor Bali Nasser is the Majid Fadouri Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies here at SAIS, and a non-resident senior fellow at Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. He served as the eighth dean of Johns Hopkins SAIS, previously served as senior advisor to the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, Ambassador Richard Holbrook, and is the author of several books about American foreign policy, geopolitics, and Islam. Professor Nasser, I'll turn the floor over to you for about 35 minutes of moderated discussion, uh, and then we'll open the floor to audience questions. Professor Nasser, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for that introduction and also for uh, uh, organizing this event and uh, inviting Ambassador Khalilza to, to SAIS. It is a distinct pleasure to, to, to welcome him back to the school. He's been a friend of the school and has appeared here with us at different points in his uh, career. I think particularly for this program, Careers in, in Diplomacy, I can think of no better person uh, for our students to engage. Uh, Ambassador Khalilza is one of the most distinguished American diplomats. Uh, uh, he uh, um, has a very unique background. He was born in Afghanistan, uh, migrated to this country, and, and ended up uh, occupying some of the most critical diplomatic positions during the uh, uh, Trump uh, sorry, the Bush administration. Uh, he served as ambassador to Afghanistan after the toppling of the Taliban and the rebuilding of that country. Played a very critical role in the Bonn Conference, which actually put together the, uh, the, 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 the foundations for, for a new Afghanistan, the one that was in power in the country for over two decades until this point in time. He served as ambassador in Iraq at a very critical time in that uh, post-war period when the, when the country was, was basically spiraling into an out-and-out -out civil war, and again played a very critical role in stabilizing uh, uh, Iraq. And then he went to the United Nations, where he actually helped salvage America's global image, uh, which at that time was, uh, was not in very uh, good shape. He's a thinker. He's an author. Uh, he's written about already about some of those earlier um, experiences. And then, as, you, as was mentioned by Sasha, during the uh, Trump and Biden administrations, he took on the job of... Uh, of uh, reconciling the warring factions in Afghanistan and, and uh, concluding a, an agreement that allowed the United States to end its longest running war and, and get out of Afghanistan. Regardless of what one thinks about the end game in Afghanistan, about the whole war, America's entrance, any of that, I, I think uh, thinking as a task of a diplomat, there is nothing more significant and difficult for a diplomat than ending a war. And, 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 uh, and I think, you know, once the time has gone, back, gone by and we think back at the Doha agreement and at this end game, regardless, again, as to where one stood on, on, uh, on bipartisan issues or on the war itself, 
This is a, a diplomatic effort that should be studied and looked at on par with the end of the war in Vietnam that Henry Kissinger uh, uh, negotiated or the end of the war in the Balkans, which Richard Holbrook negotiated. It is a significant moment in the U.S. Obviously, it's emotional. It's, it's politically wrought, uh, and ends of wars are never clean. They're always messy. Uh, but, I, but I think we, we, we're grateful to Ambassador uh, Khalizad for coming here today to uh, talk about these uh, his experiences, and particularly maybe the negotiation uh, that ended the war. So there's a lot to ask you, uh, uh, obviously. Um, so let me, let, me, uh, let me say, let me begin. I mean, uh, uh, and, and you can take it as far back as, 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 as you want. But when, when you came back to, to the front in Afghanistan uh, 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 and, and engaged the Taliban in, in, in uh, the negotiations, where did things stand? Why, was, why, did, why did the United States decide on negotiations at that point in time? Well, uh, Professor Nasser, thank you, my friend, uh, for that very kind uh, introduction. Sasha, thanks to you, and uh, I appreciate the audience uh, taking the time to come and listen to us. Uh, the American encounter with Afghanistan, uh, of course, began uh, seriously or, uh, uh, with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Since we are in an academic environment, uh, that war uh, that was conducted by the Afghans, fighting the Soviets, resisting the Soviets, was supported very much by the United States. Started with the Carter administration, but then went on with the Reagan administration. And uh, one big assumption influenced uh, uh, that war uh, on the part of the United States policy, and that was that the Soviets would ultimately prevail in Afghanistan because it was uh, uh, part of the Soviet doctrine called the Brezhnev Doctrine at that time, that a country on the Soviet Union's border that went pro-Soviet uh, 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 would not be allowed to leave that orbit, and, 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 and what the U.S. objective was at that time was to make it as costly as possible for the Soviet Union. It's, it's ultimately successful uh, 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 defeat of those who were resisting it. Defeat was going to come, and some of our greatest Soviet experts, including some associated with this August institution, uh, my mentors, uh, 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 they assumed uh, uh, that the Soviets would prevail. They had prevailed. They, they hadn't allowed Hungary to leave the orbit. They hadn't allowed the Czech Republic uh, to leave the orbit. And they were not going to leave, uh, uh, let Afghanistan leave the orbit. Why that assumption was important uh, and, and the policy implication, uh, which we are still, in a way, it's playing itself out, is that. Uh, 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 that we, uh, in order to impose costs, supported the most Islamist uh, uh, groups uh, uh, who were fighting because we thought they would fight the hardest and the longest. Uh, uh, and lo and behold, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Soviets withdrew. Uh, they weren't as tough or as, the same as we had thought. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, Afghanistan wasn't the Czech Republic or or Hungary, uh, 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 and uh, in the aftermath of that war, the forces that we supported fought each other and fought other Afghans, and then uh, 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 in alliance with uh, Al Qaeda, the Talibs, uh, with us turning our back on Afghanistan. Uh, took over the country and 9-11 happened. And, uh, and President Bush wanted to make sure uh, his vision uh, that informed his strategy for Afghanistan was uh, that uh, as Europe had been the center of world security problems for centuries, had been a dysfunctional part of the world, created two world wars, uh, uh, many other wars, 
that now it was this Islamic region from Afghanistan to Morocco, uh, the Islamic majority part of it that was the source of international uh, security problems. And therefore building uh, not only to defeat, uh, for defeating terrorism, but for making this region functional, you needed to democratize uh, 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 Afghanistan, democratize the region that uh, Europe had become from a dysfunctional region to a zone of peace, prosperity, uh, and democracy that this region uh, should also uh, would. And uh, we took on, uh, in, in fact, the two pillars of this approach was Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan. But by the time I was asked uh, to uh, uh, do the kind of the last job, this reconciliation negotiations. However, the war had gone badly. Uh, uh, the uh, Talib for seven years in a row, uh, starting uh, in 14, uh, was they were gaining more territory uh, at, at the expense of the government and the coalition forces. And uh, 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 support for the war, therefore, had also declined. Uh, politically, things had become more complicated in Afghanistan. The initial euphoria of Afghans embracing democracy, uh, 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 the elections had become very contentious. And although we had made some significant successes in transforming Afghanistan with young people, uh, with women making uh, progress, but the, the, the war effort was not going well. And second, uh, that the world had changed that the U.S., uh, uh, um, after 18 years uh, as the world's preeminent power, uh, 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 was beginning to feel overextended uh, with this war in Afghanistan. And one way is that great powers lose their relative position is either domestic decay is one option or in uh, overextension, getting involved in tribal wars or these protracted wars that zap its energies and, and uh, while the others were trying to catch up or surpass you or focused on it. So it was a combination of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a war that was not going well, was costing too much, that was the view, had lost political support and a changed world and that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, caused, uh, uh, you know, actually it started with President Obama, uh, but uh, uh, then with President Trump and President Biden, that said, we need to find a way out, and that this was a problem that uh, uh, it had become uh, uh, a place where the U.S. Uh, was not making progress, uh, uh, spending a lot, and others uh, 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 were uh, in the neighborhood or beyond, who were rivals or didn't wish us well, uh, uh, wanted the U.S. to stay and pay a price and not prevail, not, not leave and not, uh, and not prevail. Uh, and the Afghans weren't making the right choices themselves. And therefore, uh, 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 this was a drag, in a sense. It was uh, uh, on, 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 on the U.S., and we needed to find a way out, uh, and that's why I was asking. Sorry about the long no, 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 uh, actually, context. Uh, so, but uh, no, because it it's always important when you uh, uh, that you are a student, you should ask what is the assumption in forming the policy, right. because that could uh, really get you in serious trouble. We always question the strategy. Some, uh, seldom do we ask about the assumptions uh, that, that inform the approach. No, it's, it's, mm. it's actually very, very important, largely because uh, those who try to sort of second guess after yeah. we left and after the chaos happened at the Kabul yeah. airport, right. they began to second guess uh, why the talks had actually started at yeah. all. Right. Uh, so, so basically what you're saying is that um, you know, the conclusion of the administration was that the situation was not sustainable. Right even with 200,000 Afghan uh, troops and, you know, uh, 2,500. Uh, at that point, I think it was much higher, like before. They said 300,000 on paper. 300,000 uh, on paper, to, but even the American soldiers, when you started well, the negotiation, at, was 20, 30,000? Well, it depends what you count. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, sec uh, security forces of the United States, it was around 14,000. But then we had allies forces, and then we have contractors, 
if you put them all together, uh, we were uh, at, uh, I think, uh, um, substantially higher numbers. Uh, uh, and, and yet, even at, with that substantially higher number, we were losing ground. We were losing right. So, so uh, uh, I'm just to sort of construct how, how you ended up at the table. So, one question was how, how to get the Taliban to come to the table and, and under what circumstances. And secondly, uh, how to get the Pakistanis to support this. this I, I, I remember when I was uh, yes, in the in the admin, Obama administration, you know, getting getting them completely right side with negotiations was difficult. So, so how did that work out to to essentially so, be able to set the right pieces on so, the table? First, of course, uh, you know this, but for others uh, that we had already started to talk to the Taliban that started under President Obama, uh, 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 that. An office was opened uh, in Doha. It was closed, or, or at least downgraded soon thereafter, because President Karzai at that time had objected to it. And uh, when when I uh, uh, got uh, came to the scene already, my predecessor Alice Wills, uh, who was a special envoy as well as uh, working for the South Asia Bureau, was had gone to see the Taliban a few times. Uh, for uh, it, it is important to uh, keep this in mind that the ta we wanted from the beginning when when I was uh, a special envoy and then ambassador for the Talibs to accept the new Afghan constitution, renounce terror, begin a, a break ties with Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups before we would even talk to them. That we had preconditions for the talk. As the situation deteriorated in Afghanistan under, uh, during the Obama administration, initially Mrs. Clinton as a, a Secretary of State made those conditions in conditions that we would talk to them, but uh, an agreement must reflect those conditions. Uh, and uh, President Trump, after a short period of escalation, uh, uh, the new South Asia strategy and escalation uh, thought things were not going well and continued the policy. But this is a policy of talking to the Taliban before the Taliban talked to the government. So the Taliban regarded the government as a puppet, as a government that was imposed by the international community, although a, a government that was in good standing internationally recognized, but the Talibs did not accept it. And therefore, uh, what uh, I went with four ideas kind of uh, to see if the Talibs would agree to that. That one, the agenda would deal with the issue that's number one to them, which is the withdrawal of foreign forces. And on that, the Talibs and the uh, US government uh, had similar interests because the U.S. government had also become interested in uh, reducing uh, its presence and ultimately even totally withdrawing. Second, our concern was terrorism, that Afghanistan never again would be used by terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda included, uh, to plan and operate uh, to threaten the security of the United States and our allies. Three was we wanted to leave a good legacy behind <laughs> and for Afghan, Afghan war to end, to have inter-Afghan negotiations on a new government that they would both find acceptable and, and agreeable, and a comprehensive and permanent ceasefire. So the negotiations were focused on that, and, and, and we, uh, uh, we, the Talibs uh, who, uh, uh, embraced it grudgingly. We will come to, I'm sure, questions about some of the aspects. And on Pakistan, that Professor Nasser mentioned, uh, Pakistan uh, expressed uh, wholehearted support for this framework, arguing that they had opposed and had found unrealistic, if not opposed, our approach for military victory uh, and, uh, and prevailing, or the Afghan government with our support prevailing. They, they believed, they argued, that they have always believed that there was only a political settlement, that there was going to be no military solution. And now the United States had embraced the same uh, goal that they had thought for some time. 
Uh, we weren't happy with all aspects of its policy, uh, clearly, but uh, but they did uh, they did uh, 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 express their support. And I asked him at the first order to release Malab Radar, who had a reputation among the Afghan people, President Karzai and others, as someone who wanted peace and had reached out uh, to the government. And, and to my surprise, when I asked as a gesture of goodwill as to demonstrate that Pakistan is supportive of the peace process to release him, and, and they did, and to my surprise, he was appointed by the Taliban as the head of the negotiating team uh, to, to Doha. So uh, if you could give us a flavor of, you know, okay, this was the framework that, that you, you approached them, and, and there were points around which you could actually negotiate. If you can give us a flavor of what it was like negotiating with the Taliban, and, and how, how did the process move forward? Well, uh, uh, first, I have to say the Taliban took my appointment, uh, uh, to my surprise, very positively. Uh, 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 and so they were, uh, they were welcoming, and they welcomed it. They thought, that given my record, uh, having been having a, 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 a reputation of involved in all these wars, supporting them, whether Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, and, you know, uh, 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 kind of having strong ties to the U.S. security establishment, that this was serious, uh, perhaps, that, they, uh, that it means that uh, the United States is now serious about the negotiations and about withdrawal. So there was a, uh, the, uh, 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 the engagement was positive. But when it came to issues, it's a very tough group to deal with. Um, uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are obviously uh, very persistent, very tough. Uh, they, uh, 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 to them, their consensus is very was the most important thing for them. Uh, that uh, 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 that everything or anything they agree to, there must be first some consensus inside the Taliban, because there are different factions inside. Uh, and uh, they were slow, very deliberate. Uh, they are religiously trained people. They believe in, uh, you know, they want to see everything in writing, and they do a hermeneutical analysis of the text in extremely uh, uh, deliberate and, 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 and a protracted way, frustrating. Sometimes they have a page and two weeks and three weeks of argument among themselves. Uh, 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 so uh, 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 was 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 uh, and and sometimes they even voted uh, when they couldn't reach consensus and they they uh, they went along with the, um, the majority decision prevailed. Sometimes they would have to go. Part of them was in Doha, and the political commission, more or less, that they have. They had a variety of commissions, and part in uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and and elsewhere, so they would travel to get views. So it was a it was a uh, unusual to put it mildly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but that's very interesting. I mean, it, it, one doesn't think of the difficulties of negotiating with an entity which doesn't have a clear head, right. a clear decision maker right. that that right. would that would make those decisions. Uh, uh, can you tell us in the end, uh, you know, what was the essence in your view of the Doha Agreement? In other words, when when you got close to actually arriving at an agreement, uh, what, was, what was this agreement at its heart? The, the agreement had those four elements that I mentioned. They finally, we got uh, 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 an agreement, and the, the things were sequered, sequenced, and were, they were uh, a package uh, deal. Uh, and uh, first was uh, the withdrawal of uh, 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 US forces. Uh, we ultimately agreed to 14 months as the timeline for the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan. Second key element was uh, the uh, uh, commitment by the Taliban uh, not to allow the territory of Afghanistan that they control, and if they became part of the government of Afghanistan as a result of the negotiations, they would uh, not allow uh, the territory to be used by individual terrorists or groups uh, and uh, this took a long time uh, in, including al-qaeda they didn't want to mention al-qaeda as such because they thought this would m perhaps would have implications for the uh, 2001 attacks uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, but for us, that was vital that Al Qaeda be specifically mentioned, uh, not only in substance, but also for uh, given what took us to Afghanistan uh, was the attack. And third was the start for the first time in 40 years of so called uh, war in Afghanistan that the warring Afghans will sit across the table from each other to negotiate a roadmap, a political settlement. And there was a date uh, given for uh, when that would start after the signing of the agreement. And a fourth uh, element, which was a, a comprehensive and permanent ceasefire. But uh, in the details, we had two. Uh, uh, th this uh, agreement is online. It it's not, wasn't a secret agreement. But there are two uh, um, attachments, implementation documents that have not become uh, declassified, they were classified. One had to do, I can say, the topic. One had to do with the implementations of Talib commitments on terrorism as to what would happen. Uh, and the second was the implementation document having to do with the U.S. withdrawal and violence. Uh, so the, uh, that, was the, uh, that was the agreement, and it ultimately led to, for the first time, Afghans from the government and Afghans from uh, Talibs would sit across the table from each other uh, to negotiate. I have to say one other thing that, uh, that I shuttle during this period between Doha and Kabul so to keep the Afghan government in the picture of what was going on. They would have preferred to be negotiating with the Talib themselves, but we tried that for 15 years uh, 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 and it didn't work, so we said, okay, we will open the door to inter-Afghan negotiations by uh, talking to the, uh, negotiating and reaching an agreement with the Talib. If we had not done that, then the war would have uh, gone on and we, as I described uh, the situation. And second is that on the same day that we signed the agreement with the, with the Talib, there was a joint statement between us and the Afghan government that was issued and the NATO Secretary General, among others, was in Kabul for, uh, for that. Uh, and that, that the bulk of the, el uh, the elements of the agreement in that as well, but besides what our policy towards the government that we recognize as legitimate, uh, and the Talibs we say which we don't recognize as, as the government, uh, was also issued on the same day. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you why, uh, I mean, I in a way, this ended up being kind of a two-step process. In other words, a, a sort of a disengagement, cessation of hostilities between the United States yeah and the Taliban to be followed by a broader peace agreement. So why did this second phase prove so difficult? And, and you're actually saying that for 15 years it failed. So, so what, why was, what was the stumbling blocks on both sides? I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, 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 the secession. As part of the agreement, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, studied it, is the Talibs agreed that as soon as the agreement was signed, they would not attack uh, the U.S. Uh, and coalition forces. And from the day that we signed until we uh, withdrew all our forces, now the single American or coalition forces were, was killed by the Taliban. So second, uh, since they were going to continue to fight the government until they reached an agreement, and uh, we got them to agree, uh, we would have liked a ceasefire from the beginning, but insurgents, those of your students of these processes would know, to them, the leverage that they have is violence, so they don't e give it up easily. Uh, so they ins uh, agreed to some steps to reduce violence, no major attacks in the cities, no, major at uh, no, ma uh, no attacks against Afghan big bases, but that the war will go on until there is an agreement. And uh, what they, we then, uh, as a result of a very protracted negotiation, got them to agree that if they attack the Afghan forces, the United States and the coalition would have the right to come to the defense of the Afghan forces. And we exercised that uh, right uh, repeatedly. And, and uh, uh, you know, hundreds, if not perhaps thousands of Talibs were killed during the withdrawal period because we came to the defense of the Afghan forces. But they didn't, they, sometimes they fear, they, they thought that maybe our military was setting a trap for them that they would, uh, they believe that the military and some parts of the U.S. establishment didn't want the agreement, did not want to withdraw, wanted the war to go on, and so, and I sort of used that. And I said, "That's yes, that's the truth of the, uh, the situation. That we're not all in agreement in the United States on the to ending the war." 
Uh, so and they exercised the restraint, although uh, not to attack us, because they knew if they attacked us, uh, if, uh, as, as we defended the Afghan forces, that that could put the agreement at the risk as that one attack in September uh, prior to the signing uh, led President Trump to rec recall me and to say the negotiations uh, uh, have ended with the Talibs. So, uh, so the, but the year was two phases. The second phase proved difficult, just a couple of sentences, uh, because the, the two sides uh, uh, in the war, the Talibs and the government, uh, were far apart on the kind of uh, uh, what kind of an agreement uh, uh, is, is, uh, uh, they, they could live with. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I have to say that, uh, that, that uh, many in Afghanistan on our side preferred the status quo to a peace agreement in which uh, uh, they won't have those positions because you, now you're bringing a, a powerful uh, enemy uh, that you have to share with. We talked of a power sharing, and they did not. But there were a lot of specific issues that I'm sure I'll, I'll come to, but the, uh, in, the, in, in essence, it was a different vision. The government would have liked the Talib to join initially the government. Uh, you know, as you know Afghanistan so well, there is coalition or agreement between Abdullah and President Ghani. Uh, uh, they want uh, the, the government would have liked uh, uh, Mullah brother to be another uh, Abdullah, be it uh, uh, one of the senior ministers or uh, the deputy, and our talibs to become uh, come into the ministries uh, and so on. But the situation on the ground was such, and the talib demand was no. Uh, uh, um, they wanted more. Uh, and their, situ their position evolved as the situation changed on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, they became more demanding, the Talibs became in terms of what would satisfy them as the situation on the ground began to change as the Afghan forces uh, collapsed, as more areas fell to them, uh, and there was a, an evolution. You could really track it. You see what's happening on the ground and the Talib uh, uh, offers or withdrawal of offers uh, uh, as the situation changed. Well, which, which begs the question uh, as to why, why did the Afghan security for, forces collapse so quickly, right. well, in your opinion? Well, I think uh, this is one of the issues that will be studied for a very long time uh, by, I'm sure, some of you even, but I'm sure by the government, uh, our government, because there are lessons to be learned uh, from it as to how we built uh, security um, uh, uh, forces or helped build security forces. In my judgment, several things uh, were key. One, did we build these forces uh, uh, kind of in our own image? Um, uh, uh, and that uh, they were too dependent psychologically and operationally on the United States. And that once it became clear that the U.S. is going to leave, and the psychological impact, uh, maybe there was some material impact too, but the psychological impact may, may, may have been uh, uh, huge. Second uh, is uh, that the Talibs believed in a cause. They were under a lot of pressure, obviously. Not only Afghan forces, we who were after them, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I know our military, we all know them, they're quite, they, uh, you know, they can be quite uh, devastating in uh, the way they operate and the operations they conduct. So we, uh, uh, but uh, they believed in the cause that with, with those odds, uh, they persisted and fought, took lots of casualties. They believed. And that the other side, maybe because of the political wrangling that uh, happened, uh, the, uh, uh, corruption uh, that uh, was widespread, uh, maybe inattentiveness to the needs of the security forces. There's a lot of complaints that supplies were not arriving, weapons were not arriving, that they didn't believe uh, 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 as much in the cause. And third, the, the, the fact, set of factors had to do with the command structure, uh, uh, how the war was being conducted. There was a reports of kind of the, uh, you know, the centralization of decision, which uh, is not surprising, but in the, not in the chain of command, but in the, uh, in, in the palace with some advisors, uh, 
uh, and then changing commanders uh, uh, quite rapidly in the middle of a war. So there may be lots of reasons, but uh, I think uh, I certainly, from an, a U.S. perspective, and uh, you know, uh, the the, uh, the way that the force was built perhaps uh, needs to be looked at very closely as to the, was it too dependent psychologically and operationally on us as a kind of an adjunct force rather than a real national uh, security force. You know, when this happened, actually I was reminded, for those of you who have seen uh, the movie Godfather 2, there's, yeah. a, there's this part where Al Pacino goes to Cuba to open, a, to open a casino and comes back in the middle of the civil war there and decides not to do it, and they say, why? He says, because the rebels are going to win. Yeah. Because the government, and they say, why do you think that? He said, because the government soldiers are paid, but the rebels are fighting for a cause. Yeah. Except in Afghanistan, the government soldiers were not even paid towards well, the end. So, and, and if they were paid, they were paid by the United States. So, I, uh, I mean, we paid 75% uh, uh, of the government expenditure. So, uh, that was, I think, uh, uh, one uh, no, it may have been one of the factors. So I'm going to stop. See if there are any questions, and then if yeah, well, let me see first. If there's stu if there are students, and then I'll come to you if you don't. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Actually, the question Okay. All right. So, so so this lady also had her hand up as well. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Um, so a question from Caucasus and Central Asia Club. The, the US has seemed to be pretty focused on its stabilization efforts, mostly in Pakistan, uh, following the, the takeover in Afghanistan. But uh, prior to the takeover, it seemed like Afghanistan was moving closer to Central Asia with the kind of C5 plus one uh, framework. So I'm wondering what you think the future of, uh, future of Afghanistan is with regards to Central Asia. and. Uh, what individual actors and foreign policies, say U.S., Russia, China, um, what role they play in that? Of course, uh, and the struggle for Afghanistan continues. I mean, we, they are in a new phase now. Uh, of case, and uh, there are Afghans with different views. Uh, there are different, a number of fault lines, uh, you know, the, the urban, rural, uh, more religious, uh, 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 and some less, uh, more secular, uh, more democratic, more authoritarian, uh, uh, ethnic issues. Afghanistan is made up several different uh, ethnic groups, and overlap uh, with the with the with uh, the uh, uh, groups across the border with Central Asia, with Pakistan uh, uh, and Iran. So. In this struggle, I think that uh, one thing that has happened as a result of the withdrawal is that the regional dimension, as well as the, uh, the uh, domestic, the domestic was important, but it has become even more important since the, our finger, our forces are not on the scale as much as it used to be when we were there in terms of shaping the balance. And so uh, while in the, uh, some of the neighbors enjoyed uh, our uh, shall we say, uh, uh, predicament in Afghanistan, the cost we were suffering. Now they have to deal with this problem uh, in part themselves. Uh, and I believe that ultimately for Afghanistan to, uh, to, uh, to work, uh, the regional dimension is very important. And I think the Central Asia uh, dimension in particular is important because they have a great deal of interest in stability uh, in Afghanistan uh, because they would like to get access uh, to the markets of South Asia, Pakistan to begin with, but even India, but also to the, to the sea, uh, uh, Pakistani coast. And that shortens trade uh, for, uh, to them with the world very substantially. And there are a lot of infrastructure ideas about, uh, on connectivity, uh, 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 a bit, a bit, uh, um, which I, uh, which we supported. I spent a lot of my time dealing with the neighbors, except Iran, because of the lack of relations with Iran, with Pakistan and the Central Asians, because uh, uh, they can be a source of instability uh, uh, or uh, they, the, a vision of a region uh, that's more cooperative, more integrated, economically interconnected, 
makes Afghanistan more viable economically, but also in terms of the political and security, security architecture. We have some near-term need that we're dealing with the Central Asian zone in terms of uh, on various uh, dimensions, but for Afghanistan, it's a critical element and very important. Uh, hello to the audience and, uh, and Mr. Khalilzad, I'm a, I'm a US uh, veteran and also a SAI student here at Mesa's program. Uh, before I ask my question, I would like to thank you, Mr. Khalilzad, for, for working day and night to actually uh, end the longest war, not only the longest war in our history, but also the 20 year uh, looting uh, and uh, uh, looting of American lives and wealth. And, and in light of all criticism, I think, uh, uh, at least I see as a, as a very small student here as the 21st century uh, peacemaker, which, which I truly appreciate. And uh, <clears throat> anyhow, my question is that how unfair is it to you that some critics of the deal think uh, you could have done something more to save Jeroa's sinking ship uh, while selective few within Jeroa were, were not ready to give up uh, the enormous amount of illicit wealth and, uh, and power that they have acquired over the course of 20 years? Well, um, I, I would look to uh, students of, of uh, uh, this region of diplomacy of war uh, to judge that whether we could have done more. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think, uh, given the circumstances uh, uh, that we face, uh, given the desires of uh, at least two presidents that I knew uh, got to know well, President Trump and President Biden. Um, uh, the deal that we, uh, we struck, given the situation on the ground, was uh, the, uh, the, uh, the best that we could achieve. I myself, as uh, Professor Nasser said, was involved uh, earlier also in Afghanistan, besides having been born there, and, and that I care about the country and its people, uh, and uh, I, I've been supportive very much of the uh, of the effort uh, uh, for Afghanistan to be peaceful, modern, developed, uh, uh, um, uh, and I advocated all that. But in, uh, uh, but because of the mistakes we made, uh, some we made, no doubt, although we made two sacrifices, and I appreciate all the veterans, uh, uh, and the mistakes that the Afghans made, and the mistakes that the neighbors made, uh, uh, things turned out not to go as we would have liked, as initial indicators uh, uh, created uh, 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 this, uh, euphoria and enthusiasm about uh, the first two, three years of Afghanistan. So, uh, but I think the agreement, what people are, 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 are not adequately paying attention to, is it's still not comp comprehensively implemented. There are aspects of the agreement that's not been implemented. And rather than turning our back or punishing the people uh, of Afghanistan, what we need to do is to, uh, to uh, focus on the implementation of the parts that have not been implemented and use diplomacy, uh, uh, both with the Afghans uh, as well as with others leading the international community, including their neighbors, to uh, 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 implement what has not been implemented, which is uh, 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 the, the third uh, element of the agreement, uh, uh, which is inter-Afghan. And negotiations and discussions for a government that respects the right of all Afghans. Thank you for coming here, Ambassador Kalizad. Uh, it's, it was a great pleasure hearing you and Professor Nasser talk. I have more of a sociological question about the reason why the Afghan um, forces fell so quickly. I feel like sitting here in D.C., there's this temptation to give a simplistic argument about the Taliban as these, you know, tribal jihadis, um, when it seems that that idea of jihad, which was also shared by, 
you know, certain percentage of the population was also directed against an external force in, you know, against the U.S. So, you know, and I've heard anecdotes about that, you know, in, in, in news media, but based on the conversations that you've had, how much evidence there is that that view of the Taliban against the U.S. and that, that view of, the view of jihad was also shared amongst the Afghan people, which may have hastened the, also, also, you know, in the Afghan security force, and did that at all hasten the reason why they fell so quickly? Uh, I have to say that uh, I uh, was personally very surprised uh, when President Bush asked me to go as ambassador or envoy first uh, um, um, and got involved in policy on Afghanistan. Uh, my judgment was that we should try to uh, uh, avoid uh, too much of a military presence uh, in Afghanistan for uh, avoiding them, creating the impression of an occupation because the Afghan was xenophobic. I mean, this uh, my own impression too. They don't like foreign occupation. Uh, you know. And when I went there, uh, it was completely different. I was shocked by the, uh, the, the 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 attitude. This is these are. Uh, I'm talking about 2002. I arrived there in January 2002, 2003, four. I left uh, in the middle of 2005 to go to Iraq. That they uh, they could not have enough of us, so to speak. Uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, was very popular. Uh, they were just uh, they were mostly arguing why are the U.S. forces only initially in Kabul and not in the provinces? And we came up with these uh, provincial reconstruction teams as a way to also have a presence in provinces. And over time, things change. And this is, uh, uh, students would have to study this, what happened, that things change. I think the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the certainly things that we did and things that the government did. And I, I also am of the view that the Talibs, um, that weaknesses that uh, perhaps as an assessment would be that maybe we didn't take advantage of uh, in the earlier phases, there are divisions inside the Taliban, and uh, 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 they have had succession issues. Uh, there are different influences on them, uh, their own in regional uh, uh, issues from where they come. Uh, 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 so uh, it is uh, it is not as simple uh, as uh, as that. If I give that impression, I didn't mean to. Uh, but uh, at the very high level, I think those are the sort of the, the factors that I think were decisive in shaping uh, the situation uh, as we f ultimately faced and, and what happened. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalilzad, to being here. As you know, winter is close. Afghan people has a tough situation especially women. Uh, still you are able, are you able to give, discuss to, uh, or advice to US authority to unfreeze the money, a lot of money of Afghanistan, freeze by the United States to unfreeze this money because Afghanistan has a lot of problem, Afghan people. Thank you. I think uh, uh, that, uh, I believe as I alluded to, we should not punish the Afghan people, we should not allow uh, the collapse of the Afghan economy and the Afghan state. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, I have been an, uh, 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 an advocate of uh, sitting with the Taliban uh, to uh, have an agreement on the implementation of the parts of the Doha agreement that the Talibs regard as sacrosanct. I mean, they, they, they think uh, they uh, expressed commitment to the implementation of the agreement. So let's implement the parts that have not been implemented. There are issues regarding terrorism that, uh, uh, because of the change situation, that we're not there anymore, need to be dealt with. And there are things about the, the uh, 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 commitments that they have on uh, on the fundamental rights. Uh, there have been some positive developments, but still more needs to be done, especially on women's education. 
uh, and 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 girls, and also uh, 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 there are steps that the agreement requires uh, uh, of them. Uh, uh, I think a lot of uh, uh, of technocrats from all ethnic groups uh, uh, that uh, need to be brought in because uh, uh, many of these ministries uh, that are technical should be run by, for, by people who know uh, uh, what is needed, and that's uh, at, uh, at times, or in several ministries, technical ministries, that's not the case. Uh, so uh, I think this could be, uh, 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 the Talibs have some concerns about the money, about uh, some of the other uh, 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 sanctions that they are facing, and we and the international community and other Afghans have concerns. They need to be put on a list and a an agreement be arrived at and, and in writing, because the Talibs, as I described, need to look at the text, to get built consensus on it, uh, uh, and I think this, is, uh, this needs to be done. But as on an urgent basis, given that winter is coming, we need to move very quickly to make sure uh, that the resources are available for, uh, to, 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 uh, to address the needs of the Afghan people. Um, is there anything that could help the Afghan people to create a vision about the peaceful future and what, uh, what could add to that? Yes, thank you. Well, that's a vital question. Uh, I mentioned earlier the fault lines uh, uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, one of the key fault lines that... Uh, um, has shaped and affected Afghanistan's stability in a negative way for a long time, has been uh, the uh, urban-rural divide, modernity-tradition divide, uh, worldly uh, kind of joining the world, no, please leave us alone kind of uh, view. And the Afghans, the history has been that, uh, especially, uh, it, it can go back to the beginning of the 20th century when one of the kings of Afghanistan, Amalullah, visited Iran and Turkey and all the way to uh, London and, and, and Germany uh, and came back saying, uh, this country of ours uh, needs to be developed, and we need to learn from these developed countries and do some of the things that they are doing. And uh, is modernization uh, created a backlash, and a civil war from the more rural uh, Afghans started, and he had to run away. Uh, he, 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 rather than fighting, he decided to go to, an ex to exile in Rome. And uh, President Ghani had said repeatedly on many occasions that he wasn't going to do what Amanullah did, uh, that this is the continuation of that struggle uh, of the kind of more rural, religious, less worldly versus the urban. And then any group, then after the overthrow of, of King Zaire Shah in 73 that has come to power has tried to impose its vision by force on others. And it has been usually, uh, except for the Talib, the modernizing uh, force. And has led to reactions like uh, the, from groups like the Talib, if not exactly the Talib. And I think that until there is a, a formula that the Afghans can agree to with a rural, urban, modernizing, less modernizing, this challenge will continue. And there is a need for a formula uh, 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 kind of a misakul watani in Arabic that they say there is a kind of a, a, a fundamental document that, and then to stick to it, and everybody then goes by those by those rules, and that's that vision uh, that that shared and an agreement that, that is, uh, we thought the constitution was that, but then even the constitution, the modernizer didn't implement all aspects of the constitution, the limitations on power. Uh, 
Right now, people say that maybe there has to be an added dimension of a, big, a bit of decentralization maybe uh, could, uh, could buy into the diversity, giving some locals more of a say. But this is the challenge of Afghanistan, and, and, uh, and we tried uh, our approach to help uh, one of the sides uh, perhaps a lot, and it turned out it ran into the challenges that, uh, that uh, you've seen, and this struggle will continue now. It's not over. It's a new phase uh, for Afghanistan uh, and for those who uh, have an interest in Afghanistan. I am strongly against turning our back on, on it. We, uh, we, uh, we, uh, you know, we have had a, a lot of bloodshed. Uh, we have had trans of our resources. We need to, we need to uh, do what we can, but without the, uh, without the uh, U.S. military forces uh, in the picture. And we have to also be humble uh, and not to kind of exaggerate what we can do. I mean, we're all policy types and we say one, two, three, uh, uh, but it, it, uh, uh, I know some people that I respect think the best thing we can do is to leave them alone. Maybe they will find uh, a way to deal with, uh, with this. I, I think uh, I uh, may not go that far. I think we can help, we have to try to be helpful. Uh, but uh, but be humble uh, also, uh, and uh, uh, as, as as to how much uh, the limits of what we can do and what we can't do. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for coming to speak with us. Uh, my name is Umama Kabli. I'm also one of the co-presidents of Careers and Diplomacy. Um, I hope this is not too much of a hard question, but what do you envision for Afghanistan in, say, the next five years? What's your ideal vision for the future? Thank you. Thank you. I see, uh, uh, given what I just said about being humble, uh, uh, two alternative futures. There could be more, but I see two alternative futures contingent on decisions they make and decisions that others make. Uh, one is that, uh, as Professor Nasser said, we are too close uh, time-wise to what has happened. We will see uh, in time how the Talibs do, whether they um, have learned from the past, and uh, not to repeat the mistake, be more uh, um, uh, in terms of respecting the rights of uh, all Afghans and, and uh, coming to terms with other Afghans and coming to terms with the world. That's a hopeful, uh, uh, that's a hopeful future. Uh, uh, the other uh, uh, alternative is the, uh, repeating past mistakes. Uh, and I try to use that in my discussions with the Afghans in Kabul and, and, and Doha, not to repeat past mistakes. This idea that uh, you know either it's your way exactly uh, or war. Uh, that that's uh, uh, an approach that has failed Afghanistan repeatedly, uh, and uh, uh, it wouldn't work anywhere else either. Uh, and that they uh, and that they could go back to. Uh, the, uh, the collapse, uh, conflict, the interference, uh, uh, refugees more, humanitarian crises, uh, uh, all of that. But it's in their hands now in the first time, like Afghans again. The U.S., uh, can, you know, we, uh, there is some role we have. We could be blamed for that, but it isn't uh, the U.S. military did this. Uh, 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 and two, it's also really... Uh, uh, falls on the shoulders of the neighbors to a, uh, to a significant degree as well, because they're going to be affected uh, the most uh, for, uh, by uh, those developments, although we could too. I can see in the second scenario potential terrorism challenges that could, uh, could uh, b become more acute. Uh, so, uh, and this vision that was asked by the Central Asia uh, group of, for a region uh, and that is more cooperative, and that is more integrated and more connected, uh, 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 is got to be part and parcel of effort by Afghans and their friends to promote uh, 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 kind of the, an end to this long war, which uh, and to have a uh, to have a polity uh, that's more stable and that is more uh, reflective of the wishes of Afghanistan's very diverse. 
population in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the religious part, uh, although everyone are mostly maybe Muslim, but the Afghan culture is very diverse. There is poetry, there is literature, and there is education. And, you know, Rumi was born there, there were universities. Uh, Balkh is the mother of all cities at one time. Uh, they are Herat. I mean, they, this is not a, a place that uh, doesn't uh, have the kind of diversity uh, and the Talibs uh, uh, need to be mindful of that diversity if they are to, if they, this, their effort is to be uh, to be successful. Thank you all for joining us as well. Um, hope this has been an insightful conversation for you all as it was for me. Um, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.